To control the movement of trains, signals are used. Some signals are color light. But most are semaphore. Here are some different types of mechanically operated semaphore signal. Upper quadrant, stop and distance signals have arms which move upwards to the off position. Lower quadrant stop and distance signals have arms which move downwards to the off position. These signals control running movements. This is a stop signal, which the driver must not pass when it is in the on position. The lower arm of this is a distance signal, which when passed in the caution position indicates that the stop signal ahead may be at danger. The calling on signal allows the driver to proceed forward cautiously, but indicates that the line towards the next stop signal is occupied. For example, it is used for bringing trains to an occupied platform. Warning signals indicate that the line is clear only so far as the next stop signal. The shunt ahead signal permits movement past a signal at danger into the section ahead for shunting purposes only. Shunting or ground signals control movements from running lines to sidings and vice versa, from one running line to another and control most shunting movements. To increase safety and expedite traffic, control is centralized in signal boxes where one man can operate many signals and points. In this film, we shall see the connections and fittings used to work most mechanically operated signals. The upper part of the signal box contains levers. When the lever controlling a signal is moved, the lever tail moves under the box. The connection at the lever tail is a shackle and thimble joint. The screw collar for wire adjustment will be shown again later. At the lower end, a vertical wheel is used to change direction of movement from the vertical to the horizontal. This wheel is usually 10 inches or 14 inches in diameter. It turns on a pin mounted in a pedestal. Here, chain is used to pass round the wheel.
Here, wire rope is used. Chain or wire goes outside the box, usually to flat wheels. In the confined space of the leader way, these wheels carrying wires to different signals may be mounted one above the other. The pin on which the wheels turn is mounted on a flat base. And the wheel is retained by a split pin. Chain or wire rope is used to pass round the wheel. From the lead away, the wire run starts towards the signal. The wire is normally seven strand. Each strand being about one sixteenth of an inch thick. Its breaking stress is about one ton whereas the stress at the lever tail may be up to half a ton, depending on the length of the wire run to the signal. The wire is supported and guided by pulleys fixed to stakes. This stake is channel iron. Others in use are wood, or concrete. And are generally seven to ten yards apart. The pull is turned on a split pin or screw. Here are some different types of pulley. Whilst many wire runs must follow the curve of the track, it is desirable, whenever possible, for the stakes to be aligned in a series of straight lines and angles. This keeps angle pulleys to a minimum and thus reduces the force necessary to move the signal. A crank may be used instead of a wheel to change direction of the wire where limits of signal wire movement permit. Cranks should only be used for right angled turns. The crank at the midpoint of its travel having its arm at right angles to each wire in order to avoid over traveling. The signal itself is mounted on a post. A gantry or a bracket according to the number of signals to be carried. This is a metal tubular post. Other posts may be wood or lattice steel. The wire from the foot of the post is connected either directly to the signal if near the box or to a lever fixed to the post. This lever, called a balance lever, has a weight on it. Another wire connected to the balance lever goes to the signal. The 
When the lever in the box is moved, the signal moves to the off position, being pulled by the wire from the balance lever, which is pulled by wire from the box. With the lower quadrant, the arm is pushed to the off position by the balance lever. When the lever in the box is restored, the weight at the balance lever pulls the wire back. The tension is released on the wire between balance lever and signal, and the signal is designed to return to the on position by its own weight. This applies to both upper quadrant and lower quadrant arms. The weight on the balance lever should be sufficient to pull the wire back from the box when tension is released. For signals near the box, where there is not much wire to be pulled back, the weight can be small. Sometimes a balance lever is not fitted. For signals further away, there is more wire to pull and the weight must be larger. To avoid undue strain on the signalman and the fittings, it is important that weights on balance levers should be no heavier than the weight required to return the wire safely. Here is a distant arm below a stop arm. The distant arm must not be off unless the stop arm is off. To achieve this, a slotting mechanism is used. This is how it works. There are two balance levers at one end and a drop-off lever at the other. The drop-off lever is held up by a crossbar attached to it passing under each of the two balance levers. Both the balance levers have to be raised before the drop-off lever at the other end can fall. Here, the drop-off lever is being held to show you the crossbar. And either balance lever, independently of the other, can return the drop-off lever by pushing the crossbar down again. Now the connections to signals. This balance lever is connected to the stop arm and to a lever in the signal box. This balance lever is connected to a lever, usually in an advanced signal box, but to no signal arm. The drop-off lever at the other end is connected to the distant arm, but to no lever in a signal box. Its movement being controlled by the two balance levers. Here is the slotting mechanism working the signals. A lever in the signal box moves one balance lever and the stop arm. The distant arm remains at caution. The drop-off lever being held by the other balance lever. 
Now a lever in the second signal box moves the other balance lever. And the distant arm can move to the off position. Either signal box, independently of the other, can return the distant arm to caution by restoring the lever in the box to the on position. One balance lever returning the distant arm only. The other balance lever returning both the distant and stop arms. The weight on the drop-off lever connected to the distant arm is sufficient to move the distant arm off, but each weight on the other two balance levers is sufficient to return the wire and move the distant arm back to caution. When signals are in the on position, wire between box and signals is just slack enough to relieve all tension on them. If it were too tight, it would prevent the signal returning fully to the on position. If it were too slack, it might catch on something. Or fail to move the signal fully to the off position when the lever was pulled. Normal slackness is taken up by the first part of the lever movement. The rest of the movement operates the signal. Signals near the box have little slack wire to be taken up. So stroke or movement necessary at the lever tail is small. With longer wire runs, there is more slack. So in order to absorb it, the stroke at the lever tail is greater. If still more stroke is needed, a draft or gain stroke wheel is introduced and this doubles the normal stroke. Wire, like point rodding, expands or contracts with change of temperature. Between 20 degrees and 100 degrees Fahrenheit, that is the average range of temperature which may be experienced in this country, wire will vary in length up to 2 inches per 100 yards. On short wire runs, this variation is absorbed by adjustment under the signal box. Finer adjustment near detectors can be made in the run. On long wire runs, frequent adjustments are required. The necessary means for adjustment are provided in the signal box for the use of the signalman. By turning this wheel, the wire can be tightened or slackened as necessary. And where the signal is out of sight, an indicator in the box shows whether the signal arm agrees with the position of the lever. Underneath the box is an interlocking system by which levers cannot be moved unless the positions of the other levers make it safe to do so.
at all points over which traffic normally passes in a facing direction, well, there is a point detector. Its object is to prevent a signal being cleared unless the points are properly set. A slide in series with the signal wire runs at right angles to the blades connected to the points. The signal can only be cleared when notches cut in the blades coincide with the signal slide. To avoid failure, it is essential that the distance between the detector and points should remain constant. To achieve this, the detector is either mounted on the same timbers as the points or tied by metal rod to a stock rail and mounted in a floating base. Detectors may control one or more signals for each position of the points. This means they may have several signal slides which, unless installed correctly, might be able to move through notches in the point blades not intended for them. The right way to install is shown here. For demonstration purposes, a two-blade detector is used. Some slides marked N are free to move signals off when the points are in the normal position. And some, marked R, become free to move signals off when the points are in the reverse position. The point blades ensure that a signal allowing traffic to pass over points in the normal position cannot be pulled off when the points are set in reverse. And that signals allowing traffic to pass when points are set in reverse position cannot be pulled off when points are set normal. To demonstrate this more clearly, a point blade with correctly cut notches will make the movement above the signal slides. Normal slides free to move. Reverse slides held. Reverse slides free to move. normal slides held. If detectors are wrongly installed, here the two slides on the left free signals when points are set in the normal position. And the two on the right, free signals when points are reversed. During the travel of point blades from one position to the other, before points are fully closed, wrong signals could be freed because some signal slides could move through notches not intended for them.
To avoid this, detectors must be installed so that signal slides cannot coincide with notches not intended for them. And the space between the slides carried in the detectors must be greater than the travel of the points and is generally five and a half inches minimum. The detector is explained in more detail in a separate film dealing with maintenance of points and fittings. A further safeguard is provided by detonator places controlled from the box. These are for emergency use. Let's take another look at the connections and fittings which form the basis of mechanical signaling operations. At the lever tail, a shackle and thimble joint connection. At the lower end, chain or wire rope passing round a wheel, which changes movement of the wire from vertical to horizontal. The draft or gain stroke wheel to give greater stroke on long wire runs. the lead away where the wire is taken round flat wheels leading to the wire run, carried on stakes and pulleys. A crank, the post, gantry, or bracket to carry the signals. The balance lever to pull the wire back when tension from the box has been released. The upper quadrant and lower quadrant signal arms. The slotting mechanism to control movement of the distant signal when below a stop signal. Adjust as under the box and in the run to allow adjustment in wire length. Indicators to show whether or not the signal is responding correctly to the lever in the box. An interlocking system to prevent levers being moved unless the positions of other levers make it safe to do so. Point detectors to prevent signals being cleared unless the points are set correctly detonator places for use in emergency. To work smoothly and reliably, signals and equipment must be properly maintained. Another part of this film will deal with their maintenance.